going to continue looking at Jewish objections to the Messiahship of Jesus Yeshua based on the New Testament. We've looked at a few things with Messianic prophecy, like Psalm 40 as it's quoted in the New Testament, or Psalm 22 as it's translated in many Christian translations. We've looked at those, but we want to focus on a few other issues with objections to the New Testament. Um, let, let's look at Matthew chapter 27. Th this is a really interesting one. Matthew 27, verses 9 and 10. We're told that Matthew's to totally, totally confused here. First he quotes part of a prophecy from Zechariah. Then he says it comes from Jeremiah. Then he takes the whole thing totally out of context. How can you, how can you possibly believe in the inspiration of the New Testament, or that Matthew was writing accurately with something this botched and garbled. Now, I haven't done a lot of personal reflecting in this class. Uh, I wanted to cover as much territory within the text as possible, but, but I just want to pause and, and, and tell you what happened when I was working on this. I compiled my list of principal objections and then worked on writing what was ultimately a five-volume series. Originally, it was going to be one volume. We realized it was going to take three. The three became four. The four became five. And uh, I, I gathered the principal objections I heard from rabbis, from counter-missionaries, in counter-missionary books, tapes, literature. Uh, things were not on, on internet as much then, but the internet's repeated most of the, the major objections and issues. I, I put them together, put my list together, and then began to work on the content. Uh, volume 1, which contained general and historical objections, the, the, the one that I wrote last was not the last objection. It was the question of the Holocaust. I remember thinking, why did I even say that was going to be on the list? I mean, I send it into the publisher. It's on the list. It's going to be in the table of content. Why did I even have to deal with the Holocaust? And I could just, it's not, that's a Jewish objection to God or questions about God. Why do I have to even deal with that? But, but I had to because of the association of the Holocaust with European anti-Semitism and European Christianity and so on. So I, I had to deal with it. I remember I thought, whatever I write, I'm damned if I do, I'm damned if I don't. I mean, whatever answer I come up with. And I struggled and struggled, and then God began to give me insight. And, and, and just that section of the book has been taken out. A Jews for Jesus used it uh, with our permission when they did a special Passover outreach, and they had testimonies of Holocaust survivors who believe in Yeshua today. Jewish Holocaust survivors who believe in Jesus. And they sent out those videos then, it was videos back then, sent out those videos along with a mini book. It was translated into German, just that section to be distributed in German. I felt God really gave me insights. Well, as I was working on volume four, I really struggled with Matthew 27. Because I said, I don't want to give a cheap answer. I've thought about it. I've never really dug that deep and, and studied it with great intensity, but I, I, the, the, the little I've looked at it, and the, the, the objections, the, the responses to them, the commentaries. Now, I haven't spent days and weeks and months, but the hours I've looked at it, I just haven't been satisfied with the answers. And it was troubling me because I don't like cheap answers. And, and even if I have solid, clear, definite evidence for 99 out of 100 things, if there's that one that's there, it bothers me. And I would rather let it sit and bother me until I get the true answer than just come up with a superficial thing and stick a Band-Aid on it. That's why some things I've, I've read over the years, some, some scholar, some critic would attack something in Scripture. It had nothing to do with Jewishness. And I'd read it and look at it. It's like, that's a strong objection. I'm not sure of the answer. I'm not sure what the answer is. Let me think about it. Oh, I know Jesus is real. I know Yeshua is real. I know, I know God's real. I know the Scriptures are true. I know my experience with God is real, but that's a good question. Let me think about it. And then it, it may be months later it comes to me. I, I may study it for months. It may be years later. It's like, ah, that's it. There's your answer. So I, I was working on this passage, and I wasn't happy with my understanding of it. And that particular night, I had a sleepless night. I had a sleepless night. Now you have to understand, I've been following the Lord as of this recording over 41 years. And I don't struggle with doubt. I don't struggle with doubt as to the existence of God. I don't struggle with doubt in terms of the Bible being God's word. I don't struggle with doubt in terms of God's faithfulness and goodness. If I pray and cry out and don't see an answer, if I pray and cry out for something critical and don't see an answer, it may be painful, but 
I, I just have faith. I don't question. I, I don't question whether Jesus is the Messiah, wh whether Jewish people ultimately turn and Romans eleven twenty six be fulfilled. I, I don't question that. I'm, I'm quite confident about it. I'm sure about it. Oh, I have testing and challenges and pressure and battles and sometimes it's very intense, sure. But, but I don't get challenged a lot in terms of faith. Over the 41 years, there have been just a few times where it was overwhelming, this assault on my faith. And you, you're just supporting it. It's not true. You're just making it work. And, and, and whether it's an attack on, you've never, you've never seen God really move. You've never seen God really work. You can't possibly say this is messianic. You can't possibly say it's about Jesus. Whatever the attack was, there have been a few of them very intense. And I've earnestly cried out to God in the midst of it. And I've gotten answers. The answers have actually strengthened my faith thereafter. I came through stronger than I was before. Well, this was one of those nights. This was one of those nights. What was it? Ten years now? Maybe eight years ago? Something like that. A sleepless night. Every objection seemed to hit me. Every attack on the New Testament seemed to hit me. Every atheistic assault on the reality of God seemed to hit me. Every counter-missionary objection seemed to hit me. Everything questioning my experience in God over the years. I, I mean, it was intense. A sleepless night. The next day, I went back to this text and started digging and Whoa, that's what Matthew was saying. That's what he was getting at. Wow, so I, I want to go through this and take a little time and, and, and say, let's say this was something in Talmud, you're a religious Jew, you dig and try to figure out, okay, well, was he saying this or was he saying this or should I interpret it like this or should I interpret it like this? Let's look at Matthew in a little more depth here. Matthew chapter 27. Are you ready? Matthew 27. Verse 3, when Judas' betrayer saw that Jesus, Yeshua, was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. So to whom? Chief priests and elders. Saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury since it's blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed. Problem number one, that's not Jeremiah, that's Zechariah. Problem number one. Well, here's one answer. That just like you can quote a larger collection of writings and within it you're quoting one, well, what if the scroll of Zechariah, being a smaller book, was joined together to the scroll of, of Jeremiah? So they're just quoting from Jeremiah, the larger scroll, and Zechariah was part of it. Hey, it's possible, but I've got no concrete evidence for it, nor is that what I think what's happening. I think what's happening here is this. And I'm quite sure of this, but I say I think just to lay this possibility out. That Matthew is primarily quoting Zedekiah. Zedekiah. Zechariah. <laughs> He's primarily quoting Zechariah. I've had Zedekiah in the back of my mind for minutes now. He's primarily quoting Zechariah, but with reference to Jeremiah's prophecies about judgment on Jerusalem judgment on the chief priests and elders. And he wants, he wants us to know it's not just a prophecy of Zechariah, it's also a prophecy of Jeremiah. Dig and look. And this is also one of those passages which indicates to us that he was reading this in Hebrew, not in Greek, not in an Aramaic paraphrase. So let me, let me break this down for you, all right? Let me break this down for you. First problem, text seems to come from Zechariah 11 rather than anywhere in Jeremiah. Second, there's no reference to a potter's field in the text in, Jer in Zechariah. They took the 30 silver coins, the price set in him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. 
Zechariah 11, 11 through 13 does, doesn't mention a potter's field. Let's, let's just go back and, and look at that. There, there's no potter's field mentioned. Here's what's written in Zechariah 11, beginning in verse 11. So it was annulled on that day, and the sheep traders who were watching me knew that it was the word of the Lord. Then I said to them, if it seems good to you, give me my wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Matthew says they took the silver, 30 silver coins, the price set in him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. So, first thing, did, did Matthew get Zechariah and Jeremiah confused? Well, the problem with that is, is, is that he had a long time to work on this. To get it confused is strange, and then why didn't all the scribes afterwards just change it? Okay, Matthew made a mistake here. He made a mistake. We're copying this text out, and we see you made a mistake. Uh, so so that's, that's unlikely. He's quoting from memory, he made a mistake. Well, he wasn't just quoting from memory. He'd studied these things, looked at them for, for years. And, and the idea, the idea that a, a later scribe changed it, well, you're not going to do that. A scribe's not going to change something correct and make it into something erroneous, then everybody else copies that out. And, and the idea that it was part of a larger scroll, and it's possible many Christians use that explanation. I'm, I'm in no way convinced of it. So my understanding is this, while quoting primarily from Zechariah, Matthew was pointing the reader to a key passage or theme in Jeremiah as well, one that tied in with the point he wanted to make. Thus, to draw this to the reader's attention, he made reference to Jeremiah, since the reference to Zechariah would be obvious. Now, we have Mark, by the way, quoting from both Isaiah and Malachi, but it says it's written in Isaiah the prophet. So he quotes Isaiah and Malachi, but just references Isaiah, the greater one, the one that comes first, quotes that, and then quotes Malachi as well. So... Matthew could be doing something similar to this. Well, what about the potter's field? Now, I'm, I'm going to expand on this, but I just want to lay this out. What about the potter's field? And I'm going into depth in this just to show you how we would do this, to show you how we tackle an objection head on and dig deep into it and see what we can learn. What about the potter's field? Well, first, let's deal with the issue of the potter. In the NIV, Zechariah eleven thirteen reads, And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they priced me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. The New Jewish version reads, The Lord said to me, Deposit it in the treasury. And I took the 30 shekels and deposited it in the treasury in the house of the Lord. With a note that the meaning of some of the words, including treasury, is uncertain. This is interesting. In the Hebrew text, it reads Hayotzer, the potter. But some textual and trader, interpretive traditions understood this to be the, the equivalent of Hayotzer, the treasury. That's how some of the rabbinic commentaries read it. Or Hayotzer, the keeper of the treasury. So rabbinic traditions are saying, is this the potter or is it treasury or the keeper of the treasury? The only, the only issue is that the Hebrew yotzer itself does not mean treasurer or treasury or keeper of the treasury. It does not mean that. It means potter, one who forms things within the Hebrew scriptures. Also, the text really says throw it, not deposit it. Not deposit it in the treasury, but throw it to the potter. The Septuagint understood how yotzer to refer to the furnace, smelt meaning smelter, a possible with otherwise unattested usage of this noun in the Tanakh. So which version did Matthew follow? Well, he, he cited the Septuagint in part, um, but did he cite it here? No, not, not in full here. Did he follow the tradition reflected later in the Targum, the Targumic interpretation, tying it with the treasury? No. See, these were interpretive traditions that were available in his day, either in writing or orally. Did he follow either one? No. What did he do? He translated directly from the Hebrew, rendering Hayotzer as the potter, but with the addition of one detail that in hindsight made tremendous, made tremendous prophetic sense. The money that was cast into the house of the Lord for the potter was actually used to buy the potter's field. Matthew is adding that in to explain the money for the potter was given 
to buy the potter's field. What did the potter do with the money? The potter bought a field. In other words, this was not a, math, a matter of Matthew creating a story to fit the biblical text, as if his secret agenda was to make it look as if Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. Rather, as Carson noted, D.A. Carson, when we examine Matthew's quotation clause by clause, we can see impressive reasonings for holding that the narrative does not grow out of the prophecy. Ah, ah, did you get that? Matthew is talking about the potter buy, using the money to buy a field, right? Zechariah 11 doesn't speak about potter's field. It speaks about the potter. If Matthew was saying, ooh, ooh, look at this, look at this, I'm going to create a narrative that the money was used to buy a potter's field. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a narrative that the money was used to buy a potter's field, and then I'm going to put that back in the Hebrew text. Well, why when the Hebrew text doesn't talk about it? Rather, this actually happened. The money was actually used to buy the potter's field. And Matthew looks at this, says the same 30 pieces of silver involved in a betrayal. 30 pieces of silver. And, and, and the potter's field is bought. Zechariah 11 says it's given to the potter. Potter's field is bought with the 30 pieces of silver. This actually happened. Oh, look at this. He didn't create the text to, to, in, in Matthew to line up with something that wasn't in Zechariah. Something actually happened in his day. And when he looked back in Zechariah, he said, what do you know? Look at this, but, but let's, let's, go, let's go further with this. Let's go further. Why did he make reference to Jeremiah? It's one thing to say, okay, small jump. I took the 30 pieces of silver, threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. Small jump from that to, to the potter, to the potter for his field. I mean, that's nothing. Why did he make reference to Jeremiah? Wasn't this prophecy close enough? Why didn't he just say Zechariah? Why did he make reference to Jeremiah? There's a reason for it. There's a reason for it. Any reader familiar with the scriptures would have known that the verse itself was drawn from Zechariah, not Jeremiah. So there must be something else with Matthew, with, to which Matthew was pointing. Now some said, well, maybe, maybe he talks about the potter in, in, in Jeremiah 18. Interesting, but, but no real connection. Well, he buys a field in Jeremiah 32. Is it time about buying the field? No, no, no. I don't think so there. Jeremiah 19. Jeremiah 19. This is the larger prophecy. Jeremiah 19 and Zechariah 11. Check this out. Jeremiah 19. The prophet is commanded by the Lord to buy a clay jar from a yotzer potter. And he's to take it in the presence of the elders and the priests. Remember Matthew 27, the chief priests and the elders? And he's to go to the Valley of Ben-Hinnom near the entrance to the, of the potsherd gate. And he's to proclaim a word of solemn judgment. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Listen, I'm going to bring a disaster on this place that will make the ears of everyone who hears it tingle. 1911, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I will smash this nation in the city just as this potter's jar is smashed and cannot be repaired. Now, look at this. 19.4. Not only would God destroy Jerusalem because of its idolatry, but also because, quote, they have filled this place with the blood of the innocent. Matthew 27.4. What does Judas say? I have betrayed innocent blood. What happens to Jerusalem as a result of the betrayal of innocent blood in Jeremiah's day? City destroyed. What happens to Jerusalem as a result of the betrayal of the Messiah and shedding of innocent blood? City destroyed. And interestingly, just a linguistic connection, a yotzer, a potter, connected with Jeremiah 19, and connect it with Zechariah chapter 11. And, and oh, oh, hang on, hang on. It was this blood money that was used to buy the potter's field called what? Field the blood. And to whom did Judas make this confession? And who was it that decided to use the blood money to buy the potter's field? It was the chief priests and the elders, shades of Jeremiah 19.1. Note also that Jeremiah, after breaking the potter's jar, declares they will bury the dead in Tophet, in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, until there is no more room. 
where the potter's field in Matthew 27 becomes as a burial place for foreigners. As a result, Michael Knowles points out, whereas both were formerly associated with potters, they now carry names connoting bloodshed, valley of slaughter, and field of blood. So, so what was Matthew actually saying here? What was Matthew actually saying? He's saying, remember the potter. Remember the blood guilt. Remember Jeremiah's prophecy about the destruction of our city and temple. It happened just as he said it would. And today there's even greater blood guilt with even greater consequences. We betrayed God's son. We've given the Messiah over to death. Judgment is near. So by citing Zechariah, which is very little with the 30 pieces of silver now being taken and given to the, to the potter. And Jeremiah says yes, uh, excuse me, Matthew says yes, to buy the field, the potter's field. Messiah betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. He cites Zechariah, but he references Jeremiah to make you dig deeper. And then you realize, oh my, oh my, blood guilt. Chief priests and elders seeing this, complicit, not repenting. Potter, potter, field of blood, valley of slaughter, foreigners buried. Wow, Jeremiah speaking of this. Zechariah, speaking of this, Matthew ties them together. D.P. Senior notes, the explicit details which have been fulfilled are spelled out in the words of Zechariah, but it is the tragic tone of Jeremiah's prophecy that colors the accomplishment of God's will in a moment of betrayal and truth. And, and other scholars have pointed out that there's a connection between Jesus and Jeremiah many ways through Matthew's gospel. Hence, yet another connection at the end here. Now, here's a question. Was Zechariah really prophesying the betrayal of the Messiah? Uh, listen to what the Jewish Study Bible says. This is written by leading Jewish academics. Many ancient readers found in Zechariah numerous references to Messianic times. As expected, some early Christian readers understood them in Christological terms. See, for instance, Mark 14, 27, Zechariah 13, 7, smite the shepherd, the sheep will be scattered. Matthew 27, 9, and Zechariah 11, 12, and 13. John 19, 37, the look on me whom they pierce, Zechariah 12, 10. John 12, 15, and Zechariah 9, 9, the Messiah riding meek and lowly on a donkey. Rabbinic Judaism interpreted many of these texts in relationship to Messianic times as well. Messianic times still to come, they say. Zechariah 3, 8, 6, 12, and the Targum, or understood with reference to Messiah. Zechariah 12, 10, pointing to the Messiah from the house of David in the Talmud, Sukkah 52a. But is there messianic significance to Zechariah 11, 12, and 13? You know, it's fascinating. Rabbinic interpretation here is, is all over the place. They weighed out my hire 30 pieces of silver. Targum Jonathan, this is Rashi, Paraphrases, and they perform my will with a few men. There are a few good men among them, such as the craftsmen and the sentries, Daniel, and so on and forth, so forth. But I do know, uh, I do not know how to explain the expression here of 30 pieces of silver exactly. Rashi says, I don't know, except that kesef, silver is an expression of desire. Our sages too explained it in this way, the bundle of desirable ones he took in his hand. The 30 they explained in the following manner, there are 45 righteous men in every generation. They brought proof from Hosea 3 and on and on to get to 15 down to 30 and 15 in Babylon, 30 in Israel. I took the 30 pieces of silver, cast them into the house of the Lord in the land of Israel. Number 30 is explained by the Midrash that our father Abraham was promised that no generation would have fewer than 30 righteous. It's like, what, what? It's all over, it's 30 pieces of silver. Here, Summary of what rabbinic commentary said, standard wage for a shepherd, 30 pieces. The 30 pieces allude to 30 righteous people who are alive in every generation, and on and on. No, 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 Matthew sees. This is talking about the shepherd. This is talking about the shepherd who's betrayed, the shepherd who's rejected, the shepherd who represents the king, the ruler of the people. And it literally happens with regard to the Messiah. He's sold for just 30 pieces of silver. He's betrayed, and then, the money given to the potter, Matthew says, to buy the potter's field. And then the striking parallels between Jeremiah 19 and Matthew 27. So I take time to say the deeper you dig, the more rich insight you get. 
Put against the grid of Jewish interpretation of the first century, this is amazingly sober and deep. Thanks so much for watching the broadcast. One of our viewers recently communicated to me, there's nothing more important that you can be doing. And you know, we hear from Jewish people through our materials, they've come to faith in Jesus Yeshua. Others have fallen away and they've come back to the Lord. Christians tell us they're now equipped to reach Jewish people with the gospel. And we, we have amazing open doors before us to reach more and more Jewish people than ever before. But we need your help. Everything we do is a team effort. Would you join together with us and become part of our team? Go to my website right now, askdrbrown.org, askdrbrown.org, click on the support banner, the TV support banner, and join us. And for your gift of any size, I, I wanna send you this book. I'm gonna sign it for you. It's an exclusive hardcover edition of my book, The Real Kosher Jesus, which was written and published in a miraculous 10 weeks time. I'll send it to you for your gift of any size, go to askdrbrown.org, click on the TV support banner, become a monthly supporter, help us with a one-time gift, and friend, be assured that together we're making a difference in the salvation of Israel. Please visit our website or call and ask how you can receive access to our countless free resources. Learn exciting information on what is happening around the world and with our ministry today. When you visit our website, be sure to check out our bookstore for the latest videos, books, and more. You may want to join us during an upcoming radio broadcast. Please contact us today for more information. Please remember, this ministry depends on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. Well, thank you so much for tuning in to this week's episode of Answering Your Toughest Questions. We are in the midst of our series on answering Jewish objections to Jesus. And these weeks, we have focused on some of those tough New Testament objections. Even followers of Jesus, committed followers of Jesus, read some of these texts and they wonder, boy, did the New Testament writers rightly understand what was being said by the Jewish writers of the Old Testament of the Hebrew Scriptures? And, and, and I don't understand how some of these things work. Well, that's what we're unfolding every week right here during our series on answering Jewish objections to Jesus. So tune in to next week's episode as we continue answering New Testament objections to the faith. And we invite all of you, if you're Jewish watching this broadcast, write to us at askdrbrown.org. Let us help you grow in your faith. And all of you, be sure to tune in next week as we continue on answering your toughest questions. This has been a paid program made possible by financial contributions to Ask Dr. Brown Ministries from viewers like you in your area. Thank you for your support.